And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, creator of the, of the era of the elementals. The one and only Gagalix Hass Halcyon. How are you doing today, man? Doing great. Thanks for having me. Thanks, thanks for have, thanks for coming on and braving time zone hell. Oh. So, I suppose the I suppose the best place to start would be at the humble beginnings, in a sense. So walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. Yeah, sure thing. So what, all the way back to, let's say, I was like, you know, 10, 11 years old. Um, I was always kind of a fan of, like, the role-playing games in general. Um, and it's something I didn't really get to do, you know. I'd, I'd be able to get a couple of friends and we'd maybe, like, play a game, like, briefly. But nothing too serious because... You know, my family was like, oh, that's kind of, like, nerdy. We, we don't really want you to do that. Um, so, for the longest time, you know, I play a lot of video games, like, you know, obviously, like, the Elder Scrolls games or whatever. Um, but as far as getting into, like, you know, Dungeons & Dragons, I wasn't really able to until, I would say, the first year was about 2018, 2019. Um, from then on, I was invited to play for, a, you know, a D&D group immediately fell in love with it and you know explored some other tabletop games and it's something you know while i don't have a family that's into it most of my friends they just love the tabletop genre um and so as far as just regular like gaming like board games now board games they did love i've been playing board games since i can remember um and video games i would say from about 11 or 12 um that also kind of sparked the fuel of my love for like the tabletop RPG genre. So I like all of those, but tabletops are by far my favorite. Mm -hmm. So with that, in, with that in mind, oh, the, when it comes when, when you when it comes to some of the other ones you dipped into out, outside of D and D, are there any na are there any names that particularly stick out that that ser that served as inspiration when it when it came to designing the era of the elementals? Oh, yeah, sure thing. Um, so when I was younger, I, I was actually a pretty decently sized fan of, like, Harry Potter, although my family didn't, and actually, you know, to this day, they're not the biggest fans of that. Um, what else? Lord of the Rings also was something I, I wanted to get into, but really couldn't. The big thing that I actually got lucky, me and actually my entire family loved, was uh, Avatar The Last Airbender. Mm -hmm. That was something they could actually kind of get on board with. And so that is actually um, one of the biggest sources of inspiration. Yeah, and I, I, obvious, obviously with the element setup, I can, I can certainly see it. Um, now, when... Now, when it comes to the core mechanics of the of um, I'm just I'm going I'm going to call it elementals for for going forward because I'm not paid by the syllable, um, right? <laughs> now, is it a is it a you say it's you say that other than damage rolls and percentile rolls, it's all it's all d twenties, um, right? So. Given so, given that, may I may I assume that we're dealing with a roll that we're dealing with a roll high approach, with percentile being the exception. Um. Yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. Now I have to say that because when somebody says that they're that a given game is is using a certain die as the as the primary mechanic, um. It actually doesn't lim it actually doesn't narrow things down as much as some people might think. Like if somebody said a game has a d6 based system, that tells me that tells me nothing. <laughs> that's that, that's actually a good point. You're right. I mean, because you know you could want to roll a one, and that's a good roll, or a six, or yeah, you're right. Well, you could have you could have a West End Games' d6 system um, is sum based. Shadowrun is success based, where you're trying to roll a, a, a set of a set of die over 
and each one has each one is supposed to be a hit or a miss based on how they based on how they roll. Both of them are, uh. are D6 based systems, but that's the only thing they have in common. That's <laughs> that's kind of what I meant by that. I got you. Wow. <laughs> um, Fading Suns uses a D20 system, but I've referred to it as D20 blackjack because you're trying to roll low, but you're trying to roll as close to the line as you can. Hmm. No, much like how in blackjack you're trying to get as close to 21 as you can go as you can go without going over. Right. Um. That's a good point. Even within, like, you know, D and D, obviously, the different like additions have like you know different ways of rolling. That's a good point. Well, all roads still eventually lead to D twenty versus um, plus and plus and minus modifiers versus, and you're trying to get over a target number. But from what I saw in the preview document you sent me, it looks like you're having it that natural twenties have an exploding effect. Pretty much, absolutely. Uh, what what made you go what made you go with that instead of the usual auto success? Um, so you know, in my personal personal adventures playing like D and D, you know, with uh, my my you know current like D and D teammates or whatever, uh, whenever someone gets a, a D twenty or a one, um, those are really some of the most exciting and most memorable moments. And so the idea is, you know, when people play the era of the elementals and get like a twenty or a one. Um, I, I'd want those moments to be memorable, whether it's memorable in some really good ways or memorable, maybe like an awful way, but either way, you know, memories will definitely be made that way. Mm -hmm. I can, I can certainly get that now with that, with that in mind, the way you, the way you wrote, the way you wrote out the, pl the plot and some of the things like new, some of the things like new game plus and the like, um, is this meant? Is this meant to be a full on, a full on system on its own, or a or a campaign setting or a module? Yeah, this is uh, going to be it's a full on system on its own. Mm -hmm. So, taking taking that taking that into account, when it comes to the when it comes to the elements, because you have six you have sixteen of them. Would it be appropriate to say that the elements are a, are a character class, i.e., when you're lo when i.e. when you're locked into an element, that's the one that you're going to be st you're going to be staying with for your whole adventuring career, or yeah, you, do you have the option yeah, you, to um, mix and match? Yeah, you you could definitely describe it as a character class. Um, although, let's say that you pick a fire, mm -hmm. there is an option in game to you know go to a certain town. You know, speak with a certain powerful like ESP elemental, and they'll actually just go ahead and like change your element if you don't like it for a certain fear, or whatever. And you can do that like an infinite amount of times. Um, mm -hmm. Sorry about sorry about that. The record the recording decided to mess with me because technology. <laughs> oh no, I've I've definitely been there. Mm -hmm. But with that in, with that in mind, when it comes to now, first off, um, I'm I'm assume I would it be fair of me to assume that it's that um. Since you mentioned it, mentioned stats in the uh, in both the preview document and in the um, Kickstarter page, that you're that um that you are going to be having a set a set of core stats. Is it a case where you have a set of six core stats and a set of skills, or do you have a different approach to both of them? So the way I I decided to handle that because my big thing is I, I wanted to try to keep it simple. Mm -hmm. So there, there there's going to be the uh, the six core stats. Um, there is technically the seventh, but that one doesn't really affect or heavily affect gameplay. That's like the morality um, mm -hmm. stat. But so there's just the six. Now one of those is the uh, the competence, mm -hmm. and that's pretty much going to be you know that's going to cover almost all the skill checks essentially. Um, uh, but there is the option for a player to specialize in like one of like twenty different like sub skills. Let's say like um, athletics, for example. 
mm-hmm. um, or like acting. So, but you know, it's also optional. So it's like if you want to, you can specialize and become really good. So let's say that you know you're looking for like I don't know, like a hidden treasure in like a, an old ruin. And so, you know, the GM would be like, all right, well, go ahead and, you know, roll like a search competent check or whatever. Um, if you haven't specialized, you'll just roll a competent check. But if you have, let's say you have like a 10 in search, well, you'll add that 10 to your roll. And so let's say you roll like a seven. So you get a 17 and that's like, oh, all right, well, you found it. Uh, if not, then you just go ahead and roll. And then, you know, whatever you roll is pretty much wherever you roll. Yeah. So. Now, take, taking that into account, are you, when it comes... Since you mentioned a plus, you mentioned a plus ten. Is the advantage when it comes to specialization that it's easier to advance? Yes. Yeah. So with that, with that in mind, are you operating on a um, point based system, or are you operating on a level based system when it comes to advancement? Point based or level based? Um, let's see. Which one would it fit into? I, I do know right now I'm actually working with, uh, and there's available, about three ways to actually play the game. Three or four as far as, like, leveling up. Mm-hmm. Um, so I actually may have the note uh, available to me. Um, I think I actually want to say it's uh, both. I'm, I, I guess if I had to choose one, it probably would be uh, level-based. What I'll actually do is I'll go ahead and uh, I'll grab the note that I wrote for that. Mm-hmm. In the meantime, I'll tell you off of memory. Um, so one of the ways you can play the game is point-based, which is where you know you defeat certain enemies that give you a certain amount of experience points, and then once you level up, you can put your points into whichever of those six stats that you want to. Um, All of them work like that, but one is experience-based. One is, like, accomplishments-based. So let's say, oh, there's a big boss southwest of here, and he's been causing a lot of trouble. If you stop him, then you're all going to get that essentially big buff. And let's say there's, like, ten of those in the game. Um, All of them kind of operate like that. It's just the terms for how you level up and how much... Um, you gain from it, you know, how much of a stat buff kind of varies based off of those three or four systems, just off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. So with that, with that in mind, uh, I'd like to, I'd like to kind of go into the 16 elements that you have and kind of get a feel for each of each of the play styles, as well as kind of dip into the, Partic- the particular re- the particular um, cultures within them, because that was one thing that I did see kind of leaning into in um, previous conversations with you, as well as the fungus preview. Right. Uh, so I'm just I'm just gonna go from from top to bottom on the list. Uh, fire. Gotcha. All right. So the fire elementals. Um, one of my personal favorites. You know, they're actually they're all about openness. They're all about you know, whatever you're feeling, just letting it out. Uh, their culture actually is one of the most peaceful, ironically. You know, you'd think fire would be destructive. Um, very laid back, very good relations with the other elementals. Um, they really don't cause much trouble. They they do enjoy, like, combat. But again, it's more of, like, recreational. Uh, so there's a lot of, like, really good combative moves as far as fire goes. But they're actually, as far as causing trouble in the world, like, lore-wise... They're actually pretty laid back. Mm-hmm. Um, electricity. Electricity. So the funny thing about electricity, um, at the time period where the players enter the world, um, it's full. You know, they call themselves the uh, electric artisan. So they're all about like you know creating technology that benefits the world. Um, you know, donating to charity. You know, they're all about that good stuff. Historically. <laughs> <laughs> they actually caused a lot of trouble because, uh, with a very minor spoiler, it doesn't have relevance with the main plot. Um, but let's just say a certain king was like, oh man, you know, we're like scientifically we're way ahead of all these other guys. Why don't we go and share our success with the uh, other guys? And if they don't like it, well, uh, 
Uh, there's now there's more to that, of course, but that's just like a summary. Mm -hmm. um, so their past is kind of uh, kind of controversial, but they they're essentially trying to make amends through their technology. Um, they mostly stay out of politics. They just kind of say, "Hey, we invented this. You guys forgot what to do with it. It may not be ethical. We kind of don't care. Bye bye." You know that they're that sort. Um, so yeah, they're that's that's them in a nutshell. There's more to it, but I don't want to just go on and on. Um, ESP. ESP. Um, ESP, they've kind of played the role of, like, mediators, historically. Um, ESP, you know, in a sense, it's one of the most powerful elements, because technically, all elementals are ESP, and that the mind is what's being used to create and control the element. Um, and so there's a, there's a kinship between all of them and the ESP elementals. Um, a lot of ESP, like, attacks and strategies, the, let's say the easier ones to perform without burning too much of your energy points, a lot of those are going to revolve around, like, mind tricks, illusions, maybe even creating things that aren't really there. Um, but at higher level, as far as offense goes, ESP can actually use uh, certain attacks from every different element, although it does cost them a high amount. Um, but yeah, within the world, they actually play the role of, like, you know, peacekeepers, um, they, they've always played that role. Even back when all the elementals lived in one giant kingdom, that was pretty much their role, was just keeping the peace. Mm -hmm. So even though the kingdom's crumbled and everyone's kind of scattered around the continent, you know, even within their own continent, they still kind of maintain that peacekeeping role. And thanks to their psychic powers, they can actually mentally go places that they physically wouldn't be able to go. Uh, so... I'm guessing that at least one per at least one person playtesting has made some sort of Jedi reference with them. Oh God, yes, oh, yes, <laughs> uh, yes, too many. Mm -hmm. So, next on the list would be light. Light. Okay, so light's a pretty interesting type because up until the point where the players enter into the world light as far as like a naturally occurring like elemental is extremely rare um there is what you'll see as you play the game there is one like legendary light figure who basically you know she was so powerful she literally changed the world without even really meaning to so it's definitely as far as like power it's you know it's really strong but it's also incredibly rare. Um, because of that, the light elementals as a people don't really exist. Mm -hmm. Like, mostly there's going to be the uh, the temples where people who sort of revere the light element. Um, and so another thing with the morality, actually, is as a, a person, let's say they want to be like a goody two-shoes, right? Mm -hmm. So as they make better moral choices, like if they max out their morality in a positive way actually can deal light like um or i say light they can deal minor amounts of light damage i should say um so that's kind of the goal of like the monks they, they essentially want to get as close to the light as possible while knowing they can never actually become a light elemental hmm. um the player essentially you know they're sort of given a serum of a sort which turns them into like an artificial light elemental but as far as the natural uh, naturally occurring light elementals incredibly rare um, flora. Flora. So flora is actually, uh, in a reflection of our own world, flora, it actually has the highest population of elementals. And once you get to see the actual world map, they have by far the biggest share of land on the continent. Um, flora elementals, they think that they are the mediators between like, you know, man, animals and nature. And so from their perspective, it's like, as mediators, we're kind of like, you know, it's Mother Nature. We have to be motherly. We have to be affectionate. We have to be dignified. That's pretty much their whole idea. Um, historically, they've actually been involved in a lot of conflicts because the thing about floor elementals is, I mean, you, you think of like a tree or like a vine or a plant. As it grows, it might start overstepping its boundaries. And that, like, that encompasses floral elementals. Like, mm -hmm. as the years have gone by, they have a tendency to kind of overreach and overstep their authority with the excuse of, oh, well, I'm just doing what's best for everybody. You know, even if that may, 
<laughs> may not actually be true. So their their history has been checkered. Um, as far as combat goes, Floor has a lot of like um, a lot of healing moves, a lot of status moves. It does have a lot of damage moves and range moves, but I would say damage isn't really the strong suit of Grass Elementals. Unless, of course, you want to go into wood attacks. That's a <laughs> that's a whole different story right there. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, uh, the the floral people they <laughs> they've been involved in a lot of conflict. Mm-hmm. Um, fungus. Fungus. So the funny thing historically, um, all the way back to when the elementals were just one people, uh, fungus was not considered its own element. They were actually considered to be like really basically strange floor elementals, essentially just weird plant guys, pretty much. Mm-hmm. Um, a couple of thousand years before the players get there, they actually break off from the floral and el- elementals and become their own thing. And so because of that, they don't really have their own land. And so, you know, the, the fungal nomads, they, they wander the lands. They, they make some of the best medicines and potions. And so, you know, should, like, your party run into them, it's like, you should buy some potions. Some of them are really, really good. Um, as, as a people, they're actually pretty laid back, um, much like fire elementals. As far as combat goes, if you want to really screw with your opponents using, like, you know, status moves and whatnot, you want to go with a fungus elemental, because that's pretty much their specialty. Um, With my favorite move personally being, you know, a move where you essentially shoot a spore at a target, and they have to make a check, and if they fail the check, they're pretty much zombified, and they literally work for you for that battle. Mm -hmm. Um, So, as far as, like, having, like, tricks up their sleeves... Nobody has as many tricks as Fungus Elemental. Not even like ESP. So, mm-hmm. so next on the list would be um, Fauna. Fauna. Okay. So Fauna, from their perspective, their idea is Fauna is essentially the nature element, the natural element. So like regular humans, regular animals. Let's say there was like a regular dragon. All of those kind of fall within the Fauna. Um, and the key characteristic of the fauna is essentially fauna, it's physically competent, but it lacks that elemental like kick that, you know, the elementals have, uh, which is why, you know, fauna, they get like a plus two for competence just mm-hmm. right off the bat, just for being part of the, uh, the fauna. Um, it's also the only, uh, one that has like true subclasses, right? So there's going to be a uh, swordsman. There's going to be, like, you know, a martial artist. Uh, there's going to be, like, uh, an archer. And all of these are, like, exclusive to the, the Fauna class. Um, and there's a lore reason for this. Um, the first human, actually, because, you know, back thousands of years ago, there actually were no humans. Uh, immediately after the kingdom fell and the elemental split, you know, there was a floor elemental and there was an ESP elemental who, you know, they got together, got married, they had a child, and that child was the first human. And so from her kind of, you know, sprouted really all the fun elementals and all the humans. Um, So they've kind of grown mostly around the floor elementals. Like, region-wise, once you see the map, you'll see that literally, you know, the the territory of the fun elementals is right next to and kind of wrapped around the floor elementals, like right there. So they've grown up being kind of babied by floor elementals, whereas the other elementals are just kind of like, yeah, we're just going to do our thing. You guys can kind of stay over there. We don't dislike you, but, uh, yeah, maybe keep out of our territory. Um, and so this has caused the development of, like, you know, the subclasses where humans are like, all right, well, I can't shoot fire, I can't shoot electricity, but I'm really good with this bow or I'm really good with the sword. And so, it, you know, it, it got to that point where they kind of specialized. Um and they are only willing to teach these things to other, like, you know, fauna elementals, which is why it's not available to any other ones. It, it's exclusive. It's, they, they feel they, they, they don't want to give their uh, skills to the other elementals because from the human perspective, they're like, well, if I teach this fire elemental how to use this sword, I mean, what am I going to have left? You know, that's like, I'm the sword guy, essentially. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So, <clears throat> next would be um, bestial. Okay, bestial. So bestial is actually, um, as you saw, it w- it's actually the first uh, artificial element. Um, it made by actually, it was made. It was a collaboration between the um, the electric elementals and actually the ESP elementals. 
Um, so it's essentially a combination of human and animal and putting taking the best of both, putting it together, and that would be the bestial element. Um, the first bestial element to be made was actually like a, uh, a human-cat hybrid, um, which went very successful, much more successful than they anticipated. Um, from then on, they actually could proceed to make about 100 more different types of, uh, you know, bestial types. Um, there's actually an option for the player where they can actually become... <laughs> Well, they, they, not, they not can, they would have to if they choose this. They become a random, uh, you know, beast type every single day. They have to, you know, roll a D100 and whatever they got. Um, also, funny story, um, being bestials, as far as the public goes, like, isn't really legal. You're just kind of trying it. You know, it's like a privilege, essentially. It's experimental. Um, but one of the assistants at their research center actually has run off. And he's actually making these, like, beast monstrosities. Um, so that's kind of an interesting, like, side note or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, that's that's pretty much all I have to say about the, the bestial. Yeah. So, next would be water. Water. Water elementals. Um, so, water elementals, that's actually yeah, another one of my, like, you know, personal favorites. Um they're, as far as history goes, their people have been actually very peaceful and have actually played a pretty big role in, like, again, being mediators, not unlike the ESP elementals. Um, they don't really have any incentive to be aggressive or to conquer because all water elementals can breathe underwater. And so they can literally live in the ocean, um, although they prefer, like, islands and beaches. And that's usually, like, literally on the continent where they live, you'll see that they mostly live, like, you know, on the beaches and offshore, etc. Um, so they've got, as far as exploration, they can go places that no one else can go. Yeah. Um, as far as, like, you know, water moves in combat, it's not limited to water. More so, you know, it's water, or it's acid, or it's goo, or even blood. Um, now, water is the easiest to control. Um, but as far as, like, specializing, if someone were to specialize in, like, blood or acid, that can be, that can be very, very dangerous for, like, their opponents in battle. What about um, mist? Yes, they are able to control mist. The only trick with mist is, you know, I, the less diluted the liquid is, the less control they have over it. So, you know, mist is something they can make, but they would really want, like, an air elemental and come together, they'd really be able to make something with that mist, you know. So, next would be cold. Cold, ooh, cold elemental. Okay, so uh, the cold elementals, they're actually known as the uh, the cold regals. They're actually, um, they're the richest of all of the elementals. Um, that's because as far as, like, skills and resources, they're just, no one is a, as good as it as them. Um, they're able to obviously freeze and preserve things. Um, they're able to take resources from the Arctic, places that no one's really willing to go, and they're able to make use of that. Um, they're also, when it comes to like their food and their resources, they're also pretty uh, conservative in that regard. I would say too conservative. Stingy, stingy you might even say. Um, but because of that, they've become incredibly wealthy. And with that, they've also become kind of bougie, bougie a little bit comfortable. Mm. Um, as far as combat goes, though, very, very dangerous. Um, Cold has some of the trickiest moves to deal with, I would say. Um, and it's especially when it comes to like cold weaponry in particular, um, cold elementals, as time has gone by, they've sort of made certain like special weapons to deal with like challenges fighting other elementals. Mm -hmm. So for example, um, for the longest time they would use just regular like ice swords, ice weaponry, whatever, when fighting like water elementals. The problem with that is, you know, a frozen, like a frozen sword is still water. And so they would find when they fight a water, water elemental, oh, you know, they can still control the water within. I can, you know. So to adapt to that, they invented, um, well, not invented, but discovered, uh, carbon ice. So with carbon ice, there is absolutely no way for a water elemental to do anything to that because it's not water-based. Mm -hmm. um, you know, carbon goes literally straight from, like, you know, mist or whatever or, or gas to, uh, to a solid. 
And so, you know, combat-wise, they're actually extremely dangerous. Um, and also, to, to mention this historically, um, you know, at one point in the timeline, they basically do attempt to, and almost succeed, at taking over the entire uh, continent, hmm. essentially. Um, with their thought being, you know, similar to the electric, but a lot more dangerous. Where it's like, all right, you know, we're good in battle. We have a lot of money. We're the richest nation. We're always donating to all these other nations. Let's just go ahead and take this over and have them run this our way, you know. Mm-hmm. Because from the, the from the cold regal's perspective, the other elementals spend way too much money. They're like, you guys, you know, you, you're, you're spending too much money. We don't like the way you're handling your resources. Let us step in and let us do it better. And, of course, they were stopped. There's a whole story behind that. Mm-hmm. Um, but they but they did try, and they did almost succeed at taking over um, the uh, the region. About, at, like, at the peak of the reign, they took over over uh, 75% of the continent. And I'm, pr- so I'm pretty like, sure some, there's some old wounds on, the, on that. No, <laughs> there are, absolutely. Uh, and, the, you know, unfortunately, because of the pride of the cold elementals, they, you know, they still maintain that, you know, especially the old generation, they've maintained that, oh, well, it probably would have been good if we took over. You know, you guys kind of did yourself a disservice. Um, there are even some who think that the cold elementals may be gearing up for uh, another try at that. But that's that's more debatable, and that's getting into, you know, some of the more modern-day politics or whatever. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave it right there. Yeah. Um, time time so time is the uh the second artificial element that was created by the collaboration between like you know esp and uh, electric elementals um and so because of that as a people you know they don't really exist currently there's about two or three like you know time research towers where a couple of time elementals live um and they're researching their powers the effects it can have um testing has gone really well uh, the current version of a time elemental, they feel, is strong, but not too strong. Um, as far as, like, you know, in battle goes, uh, time is very good for, you know, changing the momentum of the battle. So let's say that, you know, there's a battle and, like, oh, man, you know, we're getting rushed by the enemy. Things are going so fast. Well, the time elemental can freeze it and kind of give the party, room, you know, room to breathe. Like, all right, let's slow down. Let's figure out what's going on. Who's going to do what or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, they've got little tricks like that. One thing a time elemental can even do is, let's say you get an axe, right? And you go ahead and you, like, strike the time elemental. So they, they, there are two cool things they can do. One, they can just literally reverse time and undo that. Or two, if you don't want to burn up the energy points, they can actually freeze the damage, essentially. So even though they've been damaged, it doesn't actually take effect, you know, for a couple of turns. So essentially, they're slowing down uh, the the damage, essentially. Yep. Oh. Which gives them time to heal up. So. Yeah. And I'm I'm going to get I'm going to guess that at least one of your playtesters has made a has made a Zawado joke at least once. <laughs> surprisingly, no. Yeah, surprisingly, no. I am disappointed in their in their. In their geekiness, then. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sure this. Uh, there's there's another beta testing group coming up soon. I have a feeling that one of them is gonna because he, he's pretty much already confirmed he's gonna be a time elemental. So I, I I have a feeling that's coming up. He's a huge, you know, geek, you know, anime, you know, fan, etc. Mm-hmm. Now, with that with that in with that in mind. The next one, of course, would be Omni, and I'm guessing there isn't. I'm guessing with Omni, there is there, there aren't an, there isn't a set people with the uh, with Omni. Yeah, there there isn't really a set people with Omni. Uh, so the thing about Omni, um, now, now it's not as rare as light elementals. the The idea behind you know Omni is you know I forget what they're called like Omni prodigies or something. You know, every couple of thousand years there'll be someone who's born who. You know, they usually can control all the elements, and so that gives them access eventually to Omni, which is its own unique, like, fusion or combination of the elements. Um, there's actually a, uh, a temple mm-hmm. where there are a couple of Omni elementals, and essentially they're kind of being studied, but also sort of, like, living their lives there. Um, so, yeah, it's extremely rare. It's not quite as rare as uh, light, though. 
Um, as far as like combat goes, I'd recommend Omni to somebody who, well, two types of people. Uh, one, someone who kind of wants a taste of all the elements, or two, someone who is all about being random. Um, that, that's another option. You can be an Omni Elemental, and then every you know day or whatever, you get to choose a random element to be. Or you don't choose it, you roll for it, I should say. Um, so either, either one of those. Um, and that's pretty much what's about there. Are a, lot of, a lot of the easier attacks to pull off are going to be like attacks where, all right, you shoot a beam, and you know wh- how that energy manifests is kind of random. It could be electricity, it could be thunder, it could be plant. Um, you know, if you want to focus on, let's say, you want to be an omni elemental who, you know, you can use omni energy, but you specialize in electricity. Um, you could also do that too. Um, mm-hmm. What else is there? There, there? there are a couple more things to omni uh, that, that have a list, um, but. Yeah, I think, I think that's all I'll say off the top of my head. Mm-hmm. So, ne- next would be Earth. Earth. Okay. Uh, so, Earth elementals. Earth, as far as, like, how many forms the element manifests in, I, I don't think there's any other element that manifests in as many forms as Earth. And so, if, if someone were to pick Earth, I'd definitely recommend... Uh, specializing in whatever they want to as far as the people just like earth obviously has many different like forms it takes there are different groups of the earth elementals and they are they're pretty much infamous for their infighting and not getting along uh they literally they've been like like that since the beginning when they became like a people um i mean at one point in the timeline literally they have like a civil war um and unfortunately, the, the matter in question wasn't even that serious, um, at least from, from uh, my perspective. Um, so, you know, Earth is about, you know, decisiveness. That's what they believe. And, you know, decisive they are, which can be good, but often can be bad. Um, as far as conflicts with other nations, they're actually pretty low. Again, for them, it's, <laughs> it's all about, like, the infighting. That's a huge component of Earth. Mm-hmm. Um, as far as combat goes... Um, Again, you can work with all different forms of Earth. I do recommend uh, specializing in each form of Earth has its own, like, advantages and disadvantages. Um, But if you're just looking for pure versatility while sticking with one element, I would definitely go with Earth because, again, you've got sand, you've got dirt, you've got rock, you've got, like, glass, you've got crystal. As far as variety goes, it's unparalleled. So, next would be space. Space. All right. Space is actually the uh, the third and the final artificial element. Mm-hmm. Um, so, space elementals, again, not actually a people. Um, they do have their research facilities similar to um, the time elementals. But the time elementals, they like their towers. The space elementals, they actually have these, like, flying research centers actually literally just a a giant flying like sort of spaceship Mm. that like hovers a couple hundred feet over the ground and that's where they live and they kind of conduct their research um and again as people they don't exist but you know now as far as like combat goes for space elementals their whole thing is like warping space um so for example let's say that you are on square one and, you know, five squares to your left, there's, like, an opponent. Yep. So, as a space elemental, you can actually cl- you can temporarily close the gap between you and your opponent and essentially make it so they hit, you know, essentially, you, you, you know, manipulate space so they come flying towards you. And you, let's say you stick your fist out, well, they just come flying towards your fist because you close that gap. Um, there are, uh, space elementals have a lot of tricks up their sleeves. Um you know, obviously, they can also teleport. Um, they're also able to make bags of, uh, like, you know, infinite holding mm-hmm. uh, for a certain amount of energy points because yeah. they're able to manipulate the space within the bag to infinitely stretch, you know. Yeah. Hammer um, space. So, yeah, yeah. So, uh, definitely a lot of utility with uh, space elementals. Um, that being said, they're really useful for utility. Um, and if you're willing to spend, like, high energy points, they can do some really really show off tricks during combat. Um, but otherwise, you know, as far as combat, they're not the best, again, unless you're willing to really spend those, like, energy points. So, mm-hmm. 
So next would be air. Ah, air elementals. Um, as far as culture goes, air elementals, they're, they're all about, like, essentially businessmen of a sort. Um, it, it's interesting. They, they chose to live in the mountains, which no one, nobody else wanted. Um, and essentially their attitude is, we don't really want you to bother us unless you're a tourist, tourist and you're going to pay us money. Um, but that being said, we'll still, like, deliver your mail and we'll still, like, you know, sell to you and this, that, the other. Um, they're, they're very, like, like they're a very smooth talking nation and they're not like I don't know, but they're they're friendly but they're not kind if that makes any sense you know they're like friendly in like a of a, a social sense but like you know kind of somewhat stingy not unlike the cold elementals not as stingy but the level is uh, pretty similar um and historically they've pretty much kept to themselves their whole thing is don't bother us whatever just you do your thing we do our thing you know we we enjoy living in the mountains with our sheep and our goats we we like that lifestyle essentially um as far as combat air, air along with electricity is very good as far as like you know mobile attacks with a lot of range um air also you know air elementals one they can fly and two, uh, they don't take falling damage under normal circumstances. I mean, obviously, there, you know, there are some tricks people can pull to change that, but ordinarily they wouldn't take fall damage. Um, I would say air is probably the safest element to play. I mean, even dealing with like water, for example, you know, an air elemental they can like make an, a giant air bubble around themselves, and they can submerge themselves, and so they can't breathe water. But let's say the party gets submerged in water, and it's like, oh, we're all about to drown. If you don't have a wa water element who can help with that, it, you know, air, air elemental, they're that nice, like, safety pad, essentially. So, yeah, I would say, they, as far as playing, they're the safest elemental to play. So, and lastly, darkness. Ooh, darkness. Okay. Oh, man, I'm very, very happy with how darkness elementals came out. So the funny thing, um, strictly talking about darkness elementals, um, darkness isn't actually an inherently bad element. Uh, darkness represents like you know the shadows and secrecy and things like that. But I mean, again, these things are inherently bad. Um, so as far as just pure dark elementals, they're actually not bad. Um, now there is also, of course, the, the you know the TSC who are the villains of the game. Um, most of them are dark elementals. Not all of them, though. Uh, there are actually a decent amount of dark elementals who, like, they hate the TSC. But from their perspective, they're like, those guys make us look bad. You know what I mean? People see a dark elemental and think, oh, they're all like that. But it's not actually the case. Um, now, as far as the TSC goes, the, you know, a massive criminal organization within the world, um, their main philosophy could be boiled down, I would say, with this quote, which is, the problem with the light is that some shine brighter than others. So from the perspective of the TSC, they like the darkness because from their perspective, the darkness and dark energy in general is like an equalizer. Um, whereas with light, obviously different people are going to shine in different ways. And from their perspective, someone will always be left in the shadow. Um, and they, they have other philosophies. I mean, literally what you can do with, you know, when you play the game is you can find books written by like TSC members, you know, as far as like certain philosophies that they have. Um, now in combat, you know, darkness is also somewhat similar to like ESP and fungus in that it's sort of like, you know, utility and like uh, status based. But the idea with darkness in combat is it's all about taking things away from your opponent. So like, Obviously, with fungus, you would, like, be giving them status elements. You'd be, like, giving them this and that. Mm -hmm. But with darkness, it's the, it's the exact opposite. So one of the things a darkness elemental can do is they can literally take away somebody's elemental abilities. They can take them away. Um, and if that person is, let's say, they're a fauna elemental, they'll just make them really, really sick. You know, essentially taking away their physical capabilities. Um, they can take away a person's element. They can take away, you know... Uh, energy points from somebody they can temporarily like reduce a person's like max stat for like let's say competence for example um as far as like taking things away from the player they can take things away that nobody else can which makes them like extra dangerous in battle if you're not like prepared for them so and 
obviously when the player fights the TSC, <laughs> especially the higher ranked members, they're going to have to look, you know, they're going to have to be prepared for that. Mm-hmm. Um, and within the TSC, um, I, one of the things I want, because one, one of the options when you play the game is you can join the TSC. Um, I, I, a lot of the members of the TSC, they have somewhat tragic backgrounds. Again, the idea is that like with, you know, in a world filled with light, you know, it doesn't shine on everybody in a pleasant way. And so a lot of them, they've been overshadowed by other people. They've been overlooked. Um, or maybe they just have outright tragic backstories altogether. Um, so, and yeah, I guess I'll go ahead and stop right there. Mm-hmm. Now, when it comes to the power sets that each of them have, you, you kind of inadvertently answered this when you, when you mentioned EP. So I can assume that we're operating on a um, point pool instead, instead of, Instead of something more Vancian, thank goodness. <laughs> I've I've yes. never been a fan of the Vancian model, and it yeah, I work. haven't either. Yeah, and truth be told, it wouldn't work with this sit within this system. But is it is it a case where you where um there's a a bro- a broad a broad power list that you can j- that you can pick which whichever you prefer, or is it a case where you're getting um set po- you're getting set powers as you develop? Um, so th- th- that's actually something that the, the players will get to decide. Uh, the way I recommend a person play is because, you know, in a world with e- with uh, ESP elementals, the idea is when the players get to the world, you know, they, t- they turn you into a fire elemental, and then the ESPs, they get into- inside of your mind, and they teach you all of the known moves or whatever. Mm-hmm. Although there are going to be some, like, rare secret moves. So the way I recommend it is essentially each player will be given, like, a quote-unquote spell list of a sort having a list of all the moves or whatever. Um, but there is also an option for, you know, players to, if they want, learn certain moves as they, like, level up. Or, alternatively, go to, like, certain, like, teachers within the world who will teach them the certain moves. So, mm-hmm. I recommend the first way, but I am working on trying to make the second and third way available if that's the way people want to do it. All right, that makes sen- that makes sense. So... Take, so taking that into account, I, I, I remember you mentioning specializations to me in the past. Um, is it a case where there are certain subtypes you can you can take at the cost of not being at, not having as wide of a pool of abilities? So, so basically, with uh, specializing, um, it won't change the amount of moves that you can like you know learn or use or whatever. It, but what it will change is the uh, the cost essentially, of the move. Um, so let's say that you're an Earth Elemental, and you're like, all right, well, I'm an Earth Elemental, but really I want to be like a Crystal Elemental, right? So you can specialize in Crystal, so let's say you create a Crystal Sword, mm-hmm. and let's say that costs you like 50 energy points. Well, if you spe- specialize, it's going to cost you 25 instead. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it, the idea is to, you know, help you specialize and reduce the cost, but the catch is anything that's not like a Crystal Based move is going to cost double, uh, but you can still perform those moves. It's just going to cost you more than it normally would, essentially. Um, mm-hmm. So, and you know, specializing—it's not just a game mechanic. It's actually—it's uh, actually canon to the world itself. So, canonically, let's say that there's someone who is like a—you know—they specialize in sand. So, in combat, it's going to cost them more energy points to use, like you know, let's say like rock-based moves, for example. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can certainly get be- I can certainly get behind that. So, with that with that in mind, um, the way you, the way you describe it, it's, it sounds like there's a certain sto- a certain story that you have in mind. But are you going to be putting in options for people who want to um, have a different or have a different origin point than the one you've me- than the one you've mentioned? So that is something I was sort of considering and kind of played around with. Um, but ultimately I decided, at least for, for this game, uh, no, um, I, I guess, I guess in theory, if, if, um, somebody really wanted to, they could, but as far as being official, there is no official way for someone to say, oh, let's say, you know, instead of coming from a different world, they want to be, have like a backstory within the world. Like, oh, I grew up in like this ice village and I want to explore the world and, you know, I ran away or whatever. It's like, you could do that, but essentially it kind of be like homebrew essentially where, mm-hmm. you know, there, there's no official way to do it, but if, if that's what, you know, floats your boat, then go ahead essentially. All right. I get, I gotcha. So with all, with all that in mind, um, 
what would you be sh what would you be shooting for as far as a page count? Page count. Uh, so the current I uh, shot for page count is going to be um, 150 pages. Mm -hmm. um, it could end up being more, but that is that's the target goal right now. Yeah, I, and I I can I can certainly see I can certainly see that. Um, and with the, and um, I know that in the Kickstarter page you had also mentioned the concept of a dungeon maker. Is that going to be relying on charts, or do you have a different approach? Uh, it, it will mostly be relying on charts, although there will be, like, paragraphs sort of explaining, hey, you know, if you, you don't have to use this chart, you can make your own chart, or let's say you just want to use a D20 and, you know, make it simple. Um, so mostly chart-based, um, but, you know... Basically, it's going to sort of explain how, you know, if you want to, you don't, let's say you don't like the way this chart works or that chart. It'll explain and say, well, instead of using this chart. It is mostly chart based, but one thing I'm going to include in, you know, the paragraphs where I explain, you know, essentially dungeon making within the world is you don't actually have to use the charts. Um, you can make your own version of the charts or even, you know, to make it simpler, let's say that you just want to take 20 ideas from the chart. You can take those and then have the player roll a D20 and then whatever they roll for the D20, that's it. Or maybe instead of using charts, you already have like a, a solid idea for what you want your dungeon to be. So you can literally just hand pick out and, you know, whatever it is and just have it be set. So the, the, the dungeon making, is it's, it's easily probably the most flexible aspect of the game. Just because I want, like, you know, GMs to f have a bunch of freedom when it comes to making their dungeons. Mm -hmm. I, can, I can certainly understand that. Now, with all, with all, that, with all that in mind, oh, I, do, I, will be, I will certainly be looking forward to seeing how the, how the project will be developing. And of course, and of course, to the, and um, I do wish I do wish the be the best of luck on honest development in whatever form it takes. Yeah, I know for me, uh, you know, my my biggest concern, but before you know, I even launched the Kickstarter was my, my idea is I don't want to be bought out by like a huge corporation. Who's gonna take my idea and just like <laughs> water it down with like microtransactions or something like that? That's something I'm definitely gonna try to avoid moving forward. You know, even if the, the Kickstarter doesn't succeed, uh, because the idea is, let's say the Kickstarter doesn't succeed, the idea then is just to like essentially like self-publish mm -hmm. the book or whatever. So, yeah. yeah, and so with that in mind, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to. Come all the way to my show. Come all the way to my show to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens around here. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Ah, uh, I like that. <laughs> and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!